How do whales sing? The deep, haunting tones of the world's largest animals, the baleen whales, are iconic. But how they create the sound has been somewhat of a mystery. Whales evolved from land mammals, which vocalise by passing air through a structure called the larynx. Toothed whales, the baleen whale's cousin, evolved unique structures in their nose to create sound independently of their larynx. Now, a group of scientists have finally worked out how the baleen whales do it. So, sit back, relax, and listen to the story of how the whale makes its song. So when you're on a sailing boat, and you're close to whales that are singing, for example these humpbacks, you can actually hear the, the sound from the water will couple very well into the hull of the boat, and if you're in the boat you can hear them. So if you're on the ocean with a quiet sailboat, you would always hear the whale sing. My name is Kun Elements. I'm a voice scientist at the University of Southern Denmark. And I'm very interested in how animals have evolved different structures to make sound and to communicate with each other. It started a long time ago. I got fascinated by how birds make sounds. And uh, over the last years, it basically has exploded into uh, how any animal makes sounds. <laughs> basically, mostly vertebrates. Yeah, so the baleen whales are really fascinating animals. They're among the biggest animals that have ever lived on the planet. They have to find food, basically in the dark, and they have to find each other to mate. So what they do is to make sound, because sound travels very fast in the ocean, on the water, and it's also a way for them to find each other in these huge environments where we would get lost instantly. They live often in groups that sort of fall apart and then merge again, and they do this, they find each other by making different sounds. Now, most of the sounds these animals make um, are very low frequency, so they're, they're extremely low, like, Blue whales we actually can barely not hear, it's at like 10 hertz. And the other whales make sounds up to like, let's say, 100, 300 hertz. But that's still extremely low. So if you hear these recordings, they're like, mm, and we can barely not register the end of it. The baleen whales and the tooth whales, that are the two big groups of whales that exist today, they evolved from a common ancestor that derived from animals that were on land. So in land mammals, the, the larynx has two functions. The most important one, people would argue, is to separate the air you're breathing and food. So if you're swallowing food, the larynx closes so you don't get food or water into your lungs. And then on top of that, a lot of animals evolved uh, structures that can vibrate in, on expiration or inspiration that we call vocal folds in, 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 uh, in humans, for example. <clears throat> and these things vibrate and make sound. So this is this, the secondary function that the larynx has evolved in many, many animals. If you now return to water, you have a bit of a problem because you basically need adaptations to allow you to still breathe and make sound. Now, what we found is that the baleen whales have found a structurally different solution to this than the other group of whales, that's tooth whales. The tooth whales changed their larynx slowly, so it became a really good plug. It basically went into their nose and made a perfect seal from the airways and their nose. And they evolved a completely new way of making sound by evolving an organ that sits somewhere high in their nose, and these are two pairs, basically, of, of uh, vocal fold-like structures that can also make sounds. And that allowed them to, to uh, actually make echolocation sounds and to hunt prey with sound. The baleen whales went on a lot of routes. So they also had a larynx, like all the land animals, and they found a way to, to still use uh, that larynx for both airway protection and also making sound. So people have been speculating how these baleen whales make sounds, uh, and there's been lots of wild speculations, but also people have suggested that the larynx still is able to make sounds. It's just extremely difficult to work with these animals, because 
First of all, we hunted them down, they're near extinction, so they're very rare, so they're all protected now. But also, their physiology is fundamentally difficult to study because these animals, as soon as they die, they're either in open ocean and then they sink. And when they die on the beach, the tissues deteriorate very, very fast. Now, we were very lucky in this study that we were able to find three animals, uh, a sai whale, a minke whale, and a humpback whale that we could get to very fast. So these animals died, um, they beached, but under very good conditions in the sense that the temperatures were very low, the water temperatures were very low. And so we could go to these animals, get their larynx out, and actually learn about their physiology because the tissue was still very good. And this was actually a complete stroke of luck, of course, but the sai whale and the minke whale are animals that make very low frequency sounds. And the humpback also make low frequency sounds, but then also can make much higher frequency sounds, and it's, it's known for its songs. Now, this has really enabled us to, for the first time, study what's the mechanism of the sound production in these animals. So the plan was to actually test if the larynx can make sound of these animals. And to do that, we wanted to uh, drive air through and then see if we can get vibrations of different structures that are also relevant in the sense that they are mimicking or the same as the natural whale vocalizations. And so we drove air through these huge larynges and uh, got very nice vibrations of this cushion against the arithenoids. And they were in exactly the same frequency ranges as we measured in the live animals. Sure, stop, go. My hand's dying. Hmm. Can you stop it? Yeah. Stop your flame. So when we made these sounds for the first time, we, uh, we really, you got sound and that sounds exactly like a Berlin whale. So we found basically two structures that make the sounds that we think are uh, making sounds in all Berlin whales. One is a big cushion that sits on the inside of the larynx and it consists of fat and a muscle. And against that presses a U-shaped Arithenoid. An arithenoid is a, is a two tiny bones or actually a cartilages that we have that position our vocal folds that are very small in, in humans. They turn into these long rods that sort of fuse at the bottom and they became a big U shape. Um, and this allowed them to, to, when they surface, to get massive amounts of air in and out. Uh, but then they needed another way to actually make sounds. And this whole U-shape rotates against the cushion when these animals want to make sound. I think that that mechanism is the one that's ancestral to all these baleen whales. So every single animal that has been studied, they found these two structures that we described now that make the sound. So we really think that this is the ancestral way for these animals to produce sounds. And it generates very low frequency sounds, somewhere in between, let's say, 10 or 30 to, to maybe 100, maximum 300 hertz. The second thing we found is that in the humpback larynx, we found that this structure, that, what I call the rhythmoids, that are in the other animals fused at the base and make very rigid structure, in the humpback, they could still move. And what we think is that the humpback and a few other whales, the, the bowhead whales, regain this ability to move their vocal folds together, basically, and uh, make sound that way, which is the same way we make sound. And by doing that, that allowed them to make high frequencies again. So the songs of the bowhead and the humpback whale are possible because their larynx changed again and allowed them to make, basically, their vocal folds come together and make very high frequency sounds.
that we couldn't test in a lab, we couldn't also not model that, so that we really need to figure out uh, in future studies, but we think that's that's been going on. So combining our experiments and the models we made, we could now not only show what the actual mechanism is that these animals use to make sound, but we could also show what's the limitations of this mechanism. So while the tooth whales can dive extremely deep and still make sounds, because they made a completely novel organ in their nose to make sound, these animals are actually still limited because they blow air from their lungs, past their larynx, and then it goes into a big laryngeal sac that then pushes the air back. And that is a major consequence because as you dive deeper and deeper and deeper, the air you have available to do this diminishes very rapidly. They cannot actually make sounds anymore if they're deeper than 100 meters. So that limits their communication to the sur more or less to the surface. And then we found that the, what we think that most baleen whales use is this, uh, this cushion to make sound. That also limits the frequency range from very low frequencies, 10 hertz to maybe 300 hertz. Now this range from 10, let's say 10 hertz to 300 hertz and, and to the, from the water surface to 100 meters deep is exactly the range and frequency range and depth range where we make, humans make, all their noise on boats. So that's the predominant area where we are very noisy with shipping traffic and so forth. So that means that the noise we make actually limits the communication range of these animals severely and they cannot escape it. They cannot go deeper and most animals can also not go into higher frequencies to escape the boat noise and the, and the shipping noise and, and other types of noise we make for communication. And since boat engines are such a new thing on, on evolutionary scales, the whales are not able to just evolve new structures within a few decades to, to, uh, to escape this noise, basically. It's not something they can do behaviorally or by changing the motor control from their brain. They're really stuck by the physiology of the sound production in this frequency range, in this depth range. So they cannot escape human noise. So right now we do have agreements on reducing noise and there's a big focus on how can we reduce noise in the ocean. So there is already laws being made, international and so on. So that's really good. And I think we can now contribute with this paper by showing some physiological evidence that these animals actually cannot escape this noise. So we, if we really want to protect them, we need to do something there. So I hope that this, that this evidence we now have actually gives a good basis to, uh, to look again at these laws and maybe um, see which frequency ranges and, and sound amplitude ranges uh, are most restrictive for the whales and change our laws according to that. That was Cohen Elements from the University of Southern Denmark. This piece was produced by Jeff Marsh, with some editing help from me, Noah Baker. If you want to read more about Cohen's study, we'll put a link to the paper in the show notes. This piece is a little different from the kinds of things we often produce, and we'd love to know what you think of it. Please do get in touch and let us know your thoughts. Do you like this? Would you like more of this kind of thing? You can reach us on X, formerly Twitter, at Nature Podcast, or email us, podcast at nature.com.